Hi, Matt, just back here with my friend, Jamie Wilson. Hey, Jamie. Glad to meet you. How are you, sir? I'm uh, fine, thank you. We have a living legend with us here today at Gallery Furniture. It's an honor and thrill to have him here and talk about his incredible life. First of all, let me start at the basics. When were you born, sir? 1923, April the 16th. 1923. So you're 96 years old? 96. Wow. I, I, you look better than I do. I'm 68. <laughs> I hope I look that good, but I'm 96 chasing these boys around in this furniture store. Uh, where were you born at, Jamie? Gallatin, Texas. Gallatin? Where's Gallatin, Texas? Cherokee County, right out of Rusk. Right out of Rusk. Where's Rusk? Rusk is close to Jacksonville. <laughs> close to Jacksonville. East Texas. East Texas. East Texas. Cherokee County. Piney Woods. Piney Woods. Yes, sir. Red Hills. Yes, sir. So, uh, uh, where'd you go to high school? In Gallatin High School. In Gallatin. Yes. When'd you come to Houston? Uh, 1942. 1942. When did you enroll in the military, sir? Uh, February of 43. February of 43. Did you enroll here in Houston? From here, Houston, yes. Where at? Uh, Downtown, I don't remember what Downtown, uh-huh. So, San Antonio for basic, or enlisted in San Antonio. So you were in the Army Air Corps? I was transferred to the Air Corps, yes. Yes, sir. Well, and uh, how old were you when you enlisted? 18. 18. God bless you. And uh, what was the mood in the United States like back then? Uh, then the war was new, and uh, everybody was working my dad working in the shipyard, and uh, very busy time for everybody. Everybody was united in the effort. Yeah, very much so, yes. That's something we uh, yeah, it was, uh, we could we could learn a lot from being united in the United States. I, so, uh, when did you go overseas? Uh, Forty three. Forty three. Yes. And uh, where were you stationed at overseas, sir? In England. In England? Brain tree. How'd you like England? Uh, it was nice. Was it? Yes. It, a lot of things they didn't have, but uh, they made up for it in uh, pleasantries and uh, very nice people. Did they have hamburgers? No. Hot dogs? No, fish and chips. Fish and <laughs> chips. Us Texans eat those hamburgers, hot dogs, and nachos. <laughs> so, uh, when did uh, you were transferred to the Army Air Corps? Was that before or after you went to England? Before. Before. Yeah. And what 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 did you do for the Army uh, Air Corps? I took uh, airplane mechanic school in New Orleans at the Isaac Delgado Trade School. Uh huh. And I went to gunner school in Fort Marsh, Florida. And then we had overseas training in uh, Florida and South Carolina. So you saw you saw the country while you're doing that. Yes. What what was the uh, the job description of a, a gunnery man? Uh, <clears throat> engineer gunner. I took care, made sure the plane was full of gas, made sure the tires was up, made every all done all the preliminary check before and after flight. And uh, I didn't leave the plane until the gas tanks were full again when we land. Oh, is that right? Yeah, uh, and. Uh, or let's just keep the maintenance on the plane. I didn't have to do it, but I had to check it all. Now, uh, Gunner, did you man the guns? Yeah, I had the top turret. Had the 250 caliber machine, machine guns. guns in the top turret. And that's where I rode during over enemy territory. And I always rode in the top turret. So the top turret is like in, yeah, uh, uh, over sticks the, above the roof of the right airplane? In front of the tail section on top of the plane. Wow. You see lots of sky. <laughs> <laughs> I could imagine. You can't see the ground. <laughs> so uh, uh, tell us about uh, what you did in England right before D-Day. Well, right before D-Day, we were flying almost a mission every day. and uh, A mission in, into Germany? In, into France primarily. Uh -huh. uh, buzz bomb launching sites. Bridges, road intersections, and uh, so you're kind of softening it up for the yeah, Allied it was invasion. Mostly, uh, I guess you'd call it deterrent. We bombed the shipyard or submarine headquarters one time, and we flew a decoy mission over 
Dunkirk one time to draw the ammunition so to uh, draw the fire, enemy fire so the other planes could get into the submarine base. So right. what, what was it like flying over the enemy territory and they were shooting at you? Well, fortunately, I didn't get shot at until the day we got shot down. Is that right? In fact, out of all 64 missions that I made, I think I saw one German fighter plane. Is all 64 missions like. during World War II. What a great patriot. We are honored and thrilled to have uh, Jamie here today. What a great patriot, 64 missions. So how high would you fly? We flew at 12,000 feet. 12,000 feet. Yeah, just below the oxygen level, so we didn't have to wear oxygen mask or anything. But when you fly over enemy territory, you're in the turret. I'm in the turret all the time over enemy territory. And your job was if uh, a fighter plane came at you to shoot them down. Yeah, and uh, there were usually 36 planes in a group. And uh, wow! So you had a lot of lot of people looking. <laughs> so you flew in formation. Yes, we flew in formation. Uh, tell us, tell formation. us about the lead up to. Uh, D-Day, did you know something special was uh, going to happen? Uh, we suspected it, but we didn't know. Uh -huh. uh, we, I was an enlisted man. We didn't get in on the briefing, on the flight briefings. We just got in a plane and went along because we didn't know where we were going. But the pilot knew and uh, Bombardier, they all knew where we were going. But since we didn't make the briefing, we didn't know, didn't know what target was or anything else. So D-Day, June 6, 1944. Yes. And uh, can you tell us, do you have any memory of the, the night before or that day? Well, that morning we flew early. We left, took off before daylight, which was unusual. And uh, we knew it was D-Day, but only through rumors and all that. Uh -huh. And we bombed the coastal installations on the France, on the Utah beach and wherever. I don't remember for sure which beach we bombed, but we were in the bunch that bombed all the... Incredible history, you know, if, if not for the brave actions of uh, Jamie and so many brave Americans like him, we'd be speaking German in this country. So, uh, uh, did you, uh, how long was the bombing mission on D-Day? I think about three hours. Three hours. From take off to landing. Was it rough in those airplanes? No, not really. We had to go in at 6,000 feet on D-Day morning instead of 12 because of cloud cover and went underneath the cloud. So being in the top turret, I couldn't see anything. I could see flashes from the guns firing offshore, but I couldn't see the ground or anything else. It was dark. and So you flew over the Allied ships, the, the Yes. Tremendous uh, convoy there. Yeah. And you could see those guns. Well, you could see the flashing of it from where I was. I couldn't see the water or the ship channel because of clouds and dark and others. Uh huh. So did, did, then y'all flew back to England? Yeah, we flew back to England. The mission was only like at the most three hours, if that long. I don't remember exactly. What was the buzz like in, in England when you got back? Did I don't remember. Uh -huh. I just, we landed and went to breakfast and went on day and waited for the next mission. So, can you tell us about the day your plane was shot down? Well, we had been grounded for about five days. We weren't able to fly on account of the weather. Is that right? And uh, the first flying day after they started the Battle of the Bulge is when we went down and uh, the uh, Americans lost 178 planes that day. Wow. And the Germans lost their Air Force. <laughs> wow. Just about it. I don't think they flew any more convent missions after D Day. Is that right? Yeah, uh, after December the 23rd, I'll put it that way. Is that the day you were shot down? That's the day I was shot down. Could you tell us about that mission? Well, it was Preston, I found out later, was Eller Bridge, but we didn't make it. Our plane, we were one of the first shot down. And we, I landed up close to Aachen. When you, don't when you're shot down, you, you parachute out. Yes, I bailed out, and uh, the pilot was standing in the Bombay door, and he told me to bail out. The engineer, I mean the waist gunner and tail gunner, had already gone out, 
Was the plane on fire at this time? Uh, I'm going to say we were probably about 8,000 feet. Uh-huh. And because uh, we had come down and one engine was on fire and uh, left landing gear was just swinging underneath the plane. And uh, I pulled a fire extinguisher, but it didn't do any good. And the pilot was, got the bomb bay doors open and we hadn't dropped the bombs yet. So he told me to bail out and I bailed out and he was standing in the bomb bay door radio room and then the co-pilot was flying the plane when I left. I later talked to the co-pilot over the fence in the prison camp and he said that the pilot had come back and took over the plane and the bombardier was on his hands and knees crawling out of the Bombay or nose cone coming back in and when he bailed out but the pilot and the bombardier went down with the plane. Wow. And the waste gunner was shot, had been hit in the side with the German fire from a fighter plane. And uh, the radio uh, tail gunner told me that he saw him later in the hospital after he got captured, that he had died in the hospital. Mm -hmm. A guy named Matthews. And from then on, it was just walking and stay ahead of the line. So as you were parachuting down, did the uh, were the Germans waiting on you? They were waiting on me when I hit the ground. Yeah, they were watching me come down, and one of them had a rifle, and the other one there, and they had a little a farmhouse there, and they were using it for a headquarters for a sentry unit, I guess, or whatever. There's only about five soldiers there. But they watched me come down and walked right up on me. I was snow about knee deep. I landed and kind of folded my knee under me and sprained it a little bit, but not much. And I got up and they marched me up to the farmhouse. And then I stayed there probably two hours and they walked, we walked into a little town and I went into a building and they had captured a soldier there, I didn't know him, but I met him there, and the air raid siren sound went off, and we all went in the basement of this building, went down underneath the building. Actually, it wasn't a basement, it just go down, had a ladder and walked down to get underneath the building. And when the siren went off, we went underneath the building, and we stayed down there, and the bombs fell outside. Made dust all dirty underneath there, all that dust concussion had stirred it all up. But when they got quiet and we could see daylight back through the scuttle hole and we crawled back up and me and the soldier got back up and we walked across the street over there and there'd been a team of horses that were killed right there in front of it. We went over and sat down underneath some trees over there and waiting to see what to do or where to go and finally a soldier come by and told us to come with him and we walked down to the end of the street down there. There was a bridge, which was actually the target of the bombs, but they missed it by about 300 yards. <laughs> and, uh, you have had an, an, an incredible life. How long were you uh, prisoner of war? Oh, from December the 23rd to June the 30th. Is that right? Uh, Over six 40, months? 40, yeah, about six months. How much weight did you lose? I went from 180 to 118 pounds. Wow. 180, 118. Would you recommend that diet? Uh, no. Grass and snow and tree leaves and brush and whatever you could find to chew on. And well, I mean, what a great patient. They, and, and, you know, it makes, give me, makes your, uh, your uh, hair stand on end. See the sacrifices gentlemen like uh, he's, he's made for our, our incredible country. So it's, it, it's unbelievable. So tell us about um, uh, when you were, realized you were free. Uh, well, when I really realized when Patton came through and liberated the prison camp at Nern, uh, Munich. Is that right? Uh, I didn't talk to him, but he was in a Jeep, maybe 20 or 30 feet from Did me you over see him? There. I saw him. Did he I, have a presence? He was talking to the officer in charge and the German commander was with them and they, they brought all their guns up and 
turned them in and made a formal surrender. Uh -huh. and, uh, I could see what was going on, but I didn't hear anything. I was sat there and we were living in tents at that time and we had set up a regular army unit in there. We had a commander and uh, make believe, I guess you'd call it, but everybody man and we formed our squadrons and all that. Uh -huh. And uh, everybody was quiet, nice, and the uh, German guards all were very polite and when they surrendered and it was real a formal, friendly exchange of power there. And all happened with a period of about 45 minutes. Is that right? <laughs> and at that time you weighed 118 pounds? No, no, I gained back up. How'd you? I was back up to about 160 then. Uh -huh. But uh, later when we were on the road marching all the time, we used to get red cross parcels. And we had uh, three bars of soap five packs of cigarettes in each package, so we'd trade the soap and cigarettes for food. <laughs> so we started gaining weight <laughs> and uh, made it back. I uh, went through some real bad times and uh, wouldn't take anything for it and wouldn't give 10 cents to do it again. <laughs> you had an incredible life, incredible life of service to our country. So this past year, were you in D.C.? Yes, I was D.C. at D-Day. Celebration. Yes, sir. How was that? It was nice. There was 23 of us that was at D-Day in action, lined up in the newspapers. They took pictures and all that, but uh, I didn't see them. But uh, I was the one on the end. If you saw the line of yes, D-Day people, uh, I was the one on the left end. <laughs> so what was the uh, some of the biggest things you learned while you were at war? Uh, be obedient, do what you're told or what's expected of you, and don't create no problems. <laughs> Great advice for life, do what you're told, don't create any problems. And um, uh, you've lived in Texas ever since? Yes. Tell us about your love for Texas. Well, born and raised in Gallatin, Texas, graduated from the Gallatin High School and went to Houston uh, January of 42 after December 7th after the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. And- uh, How did you hear about Pearl Harbor? Another good story. Yes, sir. It was on Sunday, we had been to church and on our way back to the house, I had a member of Sweet Gun Tree down in Mr. Jarrett's pasture that had some claw marks where the possums had been climbing it. So I decided, told my mother, I said, well, if you're getting dinner ready, I'm gonna run down and see if you got possums up that gum tree. So I got down there and climbed up the tree and sure enough, there's a possum all curled up in the leaves in the hollow up there. And I got me a stick and I was gonna punch him, grab him by the tail and throw him out and beat him to the ground <laughs> and uh, have possum for supper. Oh, but when I punched him, he didn't jump out. He jumped on me. <laughs> I jumped out of the tree here, fell out of the tree, landed in the briars and sprained my wrist. I landed on my wrist and I go limping back to the house to tell my mother, I think I sprained my wrist or I broke something and I'm complaining. She said, oh, don't mind the jump Pearl, jumps from Pearl Harbor today. And it's a war going. And that's how I remember December the 7th. I'm wow. standing there with my arm broke. <laughs> so uh, uh, did you beat the mail home on your way back from uh, from World War II? Uh, yes. <laughs> One way we were liberated in Germany at the prison camp. They gave us, Red Cross gave us postcards to fill out the mail home. Well, I stayed there, we stayed there being Williamson and they was flying us out alphabetical. It took them 10 days to get down to me. And we was in the plane flying from Munich to Le Havre, France, when we got word that the Germans surrendered that day. Went on and went to New York and the train home. And I got home, San Antonio, got discharged. Well, not did just, I got on leave. And 
I come, caught the bus to Houston and took a cab to the house. And as I walked up on the porch, the mailman delivered that card. Is that right? <laughs> that I'd sent from Germany back two months earlier. <laughs> and uh, it was quite an odd number that they, I got there at the same time the card did. <laughs> so what, what's the uh, greatest thing about living in the United States? Freedom. Freedom. Yeah, here you don't have to get permission to go anywhere. Most every other country, you've got to have permission to go from one county to another or one town to another. Amazing. It, I think it's changed recently, but back in them days, you couldn't go anywhere unless you had a permit and uh, or permission to go other than around the neighborhood. How many of your uh, friends didn't come back from World War II? Oh. I don't remember how many, but very few. Is that right? Because when they, the day that they shot down, they just about wiped out our squadron. Is that right? And uh, the plane I'd been flying got shot up, but it made it back and they had to scrap it. It wasn't, they couldn't get it to fly again. And it was eventually scrapped. And, but we had then broke the crew up. I went with a pilot tail gunner, they went to a new crew, and they made the co-pilot, they made him pilot, and he got half of the crew. And so I was flying in a new plane when I got shot down. I wasn't flying my original plane. Is that right? And, uh, What's the best advice you could give to somebody uh, that's a young person to how to have a great life in this wonderful country? Well, I think, uh, Tour of Duty in the service is a good training place for young people to get started. It's not like it used to be. The, uh, whatever you call it, mining behave. But it's good training, the Army and, or any of the service. is good training to be a man or build yourself up. Of course, if you got a chance to go to school and to college, certainly go. Yes, sir. Get all the education you can get. And don't take it for granted because it's, a lot of people go to a lot of trouble to teach you. Don't take it for granted. I, I think too, all too often people like myself take this country for granted, but people like you who have fought and uh, seen your friends die for it know how special this country is. Yes, it's very different from that. And even countries now, the people can't travel without permits and get, you gotta apply for a visa and everything else before you can leave the country or enter the country. And here you can go and come when you get ready. Yes, sir. <laughs> or when you can afford it, whichever comes first. <laughs> As we close here with this incredible interview with this great patriot, Jamie, uh, what would you um, uh, tell somebody who is, uh, is young, just coming out of high school, about the opportunities that are, av are available for them in this country? I think uh, at this time, the opportunity to take advantage of what's there is great. And uh, I think they should give it some thought as to what they want to do, then work toward that aim or that desire, whatever they want to be. And uh, people who say they're waiting to decide what they want to do are wasting their time. Uh, they should make a decision and it may not work out or it may work out better than you think. And if it doesn't but, work out, you can always try something yeah, else, right? Yeah, if it don't work out, start over. And that's one thing about here. If you don't like something, try something else. How important has work been in your life? Uh, well, it's been my livelihood. Uh -huh. I've always had to work and we wasn't fortunate enough to have money, and I'll tell everybody back in the Depression days, money wasn't any trouble because nobody had any. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> you didn't have to worry about money because there just wasn't any. And you made sure and eat what you had and could get. And I worked them many a day for less than a quarter or for a quarter. Wow. Mr. Chandler used to give me, if I'd get up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock, hook up the team and run a grass digger till noon, he would give me a quarter. 
and I could take a quarter and go to Jacksonville, and I could see two picture shows, buy a banana, and have a few pennies left. <laughs> What's a grass digger? A grass digger is a like, machine, a, like a sled, but it's got hooks on it that go down, and then you can raise and lower them. And then East Texas Bermuda grass is a mortal enemy of all crops. Is that right? Back then, we didn't have uh, pest or herbicides or anything else. You had to dig it up and freeze the roots or burn them to get rid of it because every joint on the Bermuda grass sprouts. So if you start out with one this big, you get one minute like this tomorrow. So it was our mortal enemy, Bermuda grass. And you had a grass digger that uh, get up in the fall of the year, you could run it over it and turn up and let the freeze, freeze it because we uh, always had four or five snows every winter and all that, but now we don't get no freezing weather anymore like we did then. Yes, sir. But that was one way to get rid of Bermuda grass was to dig it up where it could freeze. Then, so you'd work for uh, right. five or six hours and make 25 cents? Make 25 cents. How lucky. sometimes he wouldn't give me a quarter. He didn't have one. <laughs> Let me close the interview by saying what an honor and privilege it is to talk to you. You're a true American hero. And all these freedoms, all these liberties that we all too often take for granted in this country are because of great people like you. You're an inspiration and example to all of us of uh, uh, belief in God, duty, honor, and country. And thank you so much, Jamie, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah.